joining us today. We're excited to have Dr. Dar. He is a retina specialist and director of our retina program. He's got lots of great info to share with you today on keeping your eyes healthy in, in lots of ways. Um, we'll answer questions at the end. So just put any questions that you have in the chat window. You can find that uh, usually down at the bottom of your screen. Um, put questions there and I will ask Dr. Dar, all your questions at the end so he can answer them for you. Um, with that, Dr. Dar, I will let you go ahead and get started. Thank you, Elise, for the nice introduction. And thank you, Elena, for having me today to speak to the group. I'm going to speak about four diseases that each respectively affect millions of people in the United States each year. These diseases have all been around forever and they traditionally can provoke some anxiety. The good news is that especially in the last 20 years, there have been advances such that these diseases can be managed usually in a very effective fashion. And so with that, we'll start off with um, cataracts. We're going to talk about these diseases in terms of what they are, how they're detected, how do we treat them, and what's the prognosis? So a cataract, this is a cross section of the eye and let's see. The front of the eye is right here. The front clear window of the eye is called the cornea. This is the colored front part of the eye called the iris. This is called the crystalline lens and this is the god this is our god-given lens inside the eye. And then the back two thirds of the eye is coated with essentially brain tissue called the retina. And the fibers of the retina then feed into the optic nerve. The optic nerve runs out the back of the eye and travels to the brain. And then fully one third of the brain is actually devoted to the visual signal, just to show you how important vision is to human beings. Now, there are different types of cataracts. The classic cataract is called nuclear sclerotic cataract. And these are some photos from the National Institutes of Health. Here we have a clear lens. Here we have a lens that has become yellowish brown. And then you have in between. And this is the classic age-related cataract. One of the symptoms of this type of cataract is when you start to have glare from headlights when driving at night. There are other types of cataracts as well, what we call cortical cataracts, where you get this wedge-shaped opacity, and then also posterior subcapsular cataracts, where you get some central opacity at the back of the lens. We commonly see this type of cataract in diabetics. So what, is, what are the causes of cataract? We, we have to face it. The main cause of cataract is something that we can't do anything about. It's age. As the decades go by, we all eventually develop a cataract. Contributing factors to cataracts include diabetes, smoking, alcohol use, trauma, and there might be a small role for sun exposure. Do vitamins help prevent cataract? So there was a very large NIH-funded study called the Age-Related Eye Disease Study that looked at several diseases. And one of the diseases it looked at was cataract. And it showed that a common supplementation formula of vitamins A, C, and E had no effect, that those antioxidants did not have any effect in terms of reducing or delaying the onset of cataract. There is a report from the same study that suggests a multivitamin may help. How is cataract detected? Mainly by the patient's symptomatology and by a yearly or every couple years eye exam. One of the earliest tip-offs to what we would call a visually significant cataract is significant glare from headlights at night. And the reality is that even when you start to go to your eye doctor in your 50s, that eye doctor is going to start to say, well, you have a little bit of cataract, but we use this frame, this phrase, visually significant cataract. So you may start to have the onset of cataract in your 50s or early 60s, but that cataract may not need an intervention until 5, 10, 15 years down the road. And 
we as ophthalmologists, we really listen to the patient and we try to gauge, is that cataract affecting your day-to-day -day function? When it sounds like cataract is affecting your ability to drive, your ability to read, your ability to do the activities that you want to do every day, then that can be a tip off that maybe the time for cataract surgery is coming. How do we treat cataract? It is a surgical intervention in the operating room. It is not something that can be treated in the clinic. And it is a real surgery uh, in the operating room. Thankfully, it's a 15 to 20 minute outpatient surgery. And what is used is what's called a phaco emulsification tip that is essentially a little ultrasound that is inserted through the edge of the cornea into that cataract and it breaks up the cataract, and then those fragments are vacuumed out of the eye, all using a very, very tiny incision. And then subsequently, an artificial lens, typically made out of acrylic, sometimes silicone, is inserted into the eye, and these lenses sit inside the eye in a special position called the capsular bag, and they sit there for forever, and they do really well, and patients see really well with those lenses. Now, there is the question of what's called monofocal versus multifocal lens. The traditional lens is a monofocal lens, which means one power. So that means the cataract surgeon chooses a lens power that either allows you to see really well without glasses at distance or really well without glasses at near. And then for the opposite, you'll need glasses. So if you pick if the surgeon picks your lens inside your eye for distance, that means you'll need reading glasses. If he picks your lens for near, then that means you'll need glasses to see well at distance. Now, in the last 15 years, the companies have developed what are called multifocal lenses, which have some advantages and disadvantages. Those lenses give you some ability to lead a relatively glasses-free life and have decent vision at distance and decent vision at near, but they can have some trade-offs. You can lose a little bit of contrast and you can also sometimes have some halos at night in particular. And so they are not perfect, but some people do choose to do them and they can, they can work well. In terms of success rates and complications with regards to cataract surgery, any surgery on the body can produce bleeding, infection, and those risks are overall very low with cataract surgery, less than 1%. The other risks shown here are also basically less than 1% retinal detachment and lens dislocation. About 15 to 20% of people will develop over the subsequent few years after cataract surgery what is known as secondary cataract or capsule opacification where a little bit of scar tissue develops on the back side of that artificial lens. And the good news is that that can be removed in the office with a five minute laser procedure. So that's something that is fairly easy to take care of when it develops later. So with that, we'll move on to glaucoma. So what is glaucoma? The first thing to keep in mind is that the eye has its own plumbing system. The eye makes fluid internally, and then that fluid drains, circulates through the eye, and then drains out of the eye. And the fluid making portion of the eye is here, or essentially here, and it's called the ciliary body. And then the fluid goes in this direction and goes through the pupil and then exits the eye in the area called the anterior chamber angle. And so there is a plumbing system and glaucoma is when something is uh, off about the plumbing system and typically the pressure in the eye can be elevated above normal. And glaucoma is usually a silent disease or what we call open angle glaucoma is a silent disease where the pressure may be elevated above normal and you don't really detect it as a patient. And what glaucoma does is that elevated pressure slowly over time does damage to the optic nerve. So the optic nerve begins in the back of the eye and then it runs out the back of the eye towards the brain. But the beginning of the optic nerve is called the optic nerve head. And it is susceptible to 
chronically increased pressure. Over the course of several years, if the pressure is elevated, it can cause what we call cupping of the optic nerve. So here you can see there's a nice pink rim to the optic nerve, and there's a small white cup at the center. Here you can see that the rim has sort of melted away and there's a large white cup at the center. And so that's chronic damage to the optic nerve from elevated pressure. And patients don't notice this until the very end. And so that's why the American Academy of Ophthalmology recommends a yearly eye exam once you're over 50 in particular. Um, and when you're seen in the doctor's office, one way that we track and look for any damage to the optic nerve is what's called a field of vision test or visual field test, which is almost like a video game. They put you in this box here and they shine little lights and you click a button when you see the light and that maps out your peripheral vision. And as glaucoma progresses, it can slowly take away peripheral vision, which is not desirable. And so patients can slowly experience loss of peripheral vision and then eventually loss of central vision. Who is at risk for glaucoma? The main risk factor for glaucoma is age. And then you can see some other risk factors here. A major risk factor is family history. So if glaucoma runs in the family, it's important to bring that to the attention of your eye care, of your eye doctor. How do we treat glaucoma? Typically the first treatment for glaucoma is drops that are prescribed by the eye doctor. These lower the pressure and help prevent additional damage to the optic nerve. There are also various types of surgeries. This is a depiction of a surgery called a trabeculectomy. This is a depiction of a surgery called a tube shunt. And there are also, there's also a new generation of surgeries uh, called MIGS or minim, minimally invasive glaucoma surgery. But the theme to all of these surgeries is that they essentially create an accessory pathway for fluid to exit the eye and hence lower the pressure. And really the most important thing with glaucoma is regular checkups because glaucoma caught late with significant optic nerve damage is much harder to manage than glaucoma caught early. And really in, in a advanced country like the US, no one should really go blind from glaucoma, but people do when it's caught late. And so that underscores the importance of regular eye exams. Macular degeneration. This is one of my specialties, and I spend a lot of time taking care of this disease. First of all, what is the macula? So we've talked about how the retina is the brain tissue that coats the back two thirds of the eye. The macula is the very center of the retina located right here. And so it's right at the center of the visual axis. And this is a, a shot of the macula itself. Here's the optic nerve. And this dark area right here is the very center of the macula. And from here to here is about one millimeter. And I like to tell patients that in many ways, this is the most important one millimeter in the body. Because this one millimeter is where you get all of your sharp central vision that allows you to read and allows you to watch TV and allows you to drive and do a lot of the activities that you love to do. There's a little bit of a darker tinge to the center of the macula, and that's because there's pigment at the center of the macula that serves an antioxidant effect. And we'll talk a little bit about antioxidants in a moment. And so dry macular degeneration is when you get these yellow metabolic deposits at the center of the retina. And if you think about how rich vision is, what vision means to you and the the depth and richness of the visual signal that is conveyed to the brain. And remember that one third of the brain is devoted to vision. And so that leads to the conclusion that the retina is a very active tissue from a metabolic perspective. And the retina uses a lot of oxygen. And so that oxygen metabolism can generate free radicals and other metabolites. 
And one of the ways that the body, uh, almost in a maladaptive way, handles those metabolites is by forming these deposits called drusen. And also the pigment in the back of the eye can start to develop some abnormalities, such as these little black spots called pigment hyperplasia. And so the NIH developed a grading scale for dry macular degeneration. This is a depiction of early dry macular degeneration where there's just a few of those little spots. This is a depiction of intermediate dry where there's not that many of the yellow spots, but there's one large one. And then over here is a depiction where there's quite a bit of the yellow spots. Both of these two on the right qualify as intermediate dry, but Intermediate dry is a very broad classification. This is the gentle end of intermediate dry, and this is the more severe end of intermediate dry. But the point is that uh, we'll talk in a moment about how people with intermediate dry should take some supplemental vitamins. Um, and then there's advanced dry and advanced wet. Advanced dry is when you get very profound thinning of the pigment at the back of the eye. And that pigment at the back of the eye is providing nutritional support to the retina. So if you're losing pigment, then your retina is not getting the nutritional support that it needs. And that, that's dry macular degeneration. And then wet macular degeneration can develop in conjunction with dry where you can get scar tissue, that leaks fluid and blood underneath the retina at the center of the retina. This is a depiction of wet macular degeneration. And so both dry macular degeneration with significant atrophy and wet macular degeneration qualify as what we call advanced macular degeneration. And so patients with macular degeneration can experience loss of center vision, and if you're using a grid at home, we often advise patients to put this grid on their refrigerator. You may see a black spot in your vision or a gray spot in your central vision, or you may see bending of straight lines or doorways or Venetian blinds. We have a machine called the OCT in our office that allows us to image the macula and look for elevation of the macula or fluid underneath the macula. Sometimes, not as often as we used to, we'll take a vegetable-based dye that's basically made out of tomato vines and inject it into the arm and then use a special camera and take pictures of the eye to look for leakage underneath the center of the retina. That's called a fluorescein angiogram. Now, the good news is that from 2006 onward, there was developed several drugs for wet macular degeneration. Before that, the treatment for wet macular degeneration consisted of laser, and there were different kinds of laser. We will still very occasionally do laser, but 99% of wet macular degeneration is treated with uh, these pharmaceutical agents. Um, and the, the most commonly used ones are Avastin, Lucentis, and Ilea. The generic name follows in parentheses. There's a new drug called Vebismo, which came out about a year ago that is promising as well. These are all uh, FDA approved. Avastin is used off label. It's FDA approved for other indications and it's used for wet macular degeneration is off label, but very well established in common practice and in the literature. And then these three have FDA labels for wet macular degeneration. Susvimo is the same as Lucentis, but it's a little extended release pellet that is sewn into the eye and so that patients don't have to have as frequent injections. It was recently recalled by the company approximately two months ago because of some issues. And so it may come back to market, it may not. And then BioView is still on the market, but it is not really used by retina specialists because there were some problems seen with this drug causing significant inflammation in the eye and then that inflammation causing vision loss. And so this drug is around, but it's rarely, it's not used very commonly. 
And this is a, a picture depic depicting how we inject the medicine into the eye. In the office, typically we clean the eye, numb the eye and do the injection. I know it looks scary, it sounds scary, but the good news is that patients tolerate this injection really well. Most patients will say, oh, it wasn't as bad as I thought it would be after they have their first injection. And probably in the United States, um, 10 to 20,000 people a day get one of these injections for either macular degeneration or diabetic retinopathy. So it's one of the most commonly performed procedures in America. And so we, we put the needle and it just goes into the center of the eye and the medicine is injected into the center of the eye and then the medicine travels to the macula. So I think you've probably all heard of the age of ARIDS, um, but there's a lot of misconceptions about ARIDS. So the ARIDS stands for the age-related eye disease studies. And there were two of them, ARIDS-1 and ARIDS-2, and these were funded by you. They were funded by the National Institutes of Health, and they were run by and analyzed by the National, National Institutes of Health. And so I just wanna go through some take home points from the ARIDS studies. Uh, the ARIDS studies looked at several uh, diseases and different interventions. And I think these are some common questions. So in terms of diet and macular degeneration, ARIDS showed that fatty fish such as salmon, tuna, et cetera, does reduce the risk of developing advanced macular degeneration. And so we'll commonly say one to two servings a week of baked or broiled fish can help your eyes, reduce your risk of getting more advanced macular degeneration. Also, dietary intake of lutein and zeaxanthin reduces the risk of advanced macular degeneration. And so that means dark leafy green vegetables broccoli, spinach, green beans, kale, five to seven servings a week of dark leafy green vegetables. And this one is intuitive because we talked about how the center of the retina has that pigment. And essentially that greenish pigment at the center of the retina is, sim is, a, is derived from these nutrients. And so by consuming these nutrients, you're helping the pigment and the antioxidant effect of the pigment at the back of your eye. And we hear a lot now about the Mediterranean diet and the Mediterranean diet has also been shown to slow atrophy associated with dry macular degeneration. And that's also from ARIDS. Now, in terms of vitamins, there's confusion about the vitamins. Should everyone take eye vitamins? And the answer is absolutely no. And the ARID study looked at this. And so the ARID study showed that people who have no signs of dry macular degeneration, even if, you, if it runs in the family, even if you're 65 years old, if on your eye exam, you have no precursors, no significant drusen, no significant changes in the pigment, you have no benefit from taking the vitamins. And the vitamins are expensive. They cost $30, $40 a month. They can sometimes upset your stomach. And so people who have no signs of macular degeneration or just very early signs do not benefit from taking the vitamins. And that was shown clearly in the ARID study. People who have what we would call intermediate dry macular degeneration consisting of at least one large size drusen or uh, extensive medium sized drusen, that's the group that benefits from taking the vitamins and the vitamins for that group reduce your risk of getting advanced macular degeneration by about 25%. So it's a risk reduction but it's not an absolutely preventing you from getting advanced macular degeneration. Um, 
other findings from the ARIDS, the first ARIDS formulation um, had beta carotene. In the second ARIDS formulation, they took out the beta carotene and they put in lutein and zeaxanthine. And recent ARIDS2 reports basically show that everybody should take the ARIDS2. Everybody who has intermediate dry macular degeneration and should be taking eye vitamins, they should take ARIDS2. Nobody really needs to take the older formulation, which is ARIDS1. And especially if you were a smoker, you do not want to take ARIDS1 because the beta carotene in ARIDS-1 increases your risk of lung cancer. And so if you are told by your eye doctor that you have intermediate dry macular degeneration, take the ARIDS-2 formula. People will ask, should I take omega-3 fatty acids instead of eating fish? And what is interesting is that the ARIDS-2 study showed no benefit to taking omega-3 fatty acids. So there's a little bit of a mystery in the sense that yes, there is benefit to eating one to two servings a week of baked or broiled fish, but you don't get that same benefit by taking omega-3 fatty acid supplements. We don't know exactly why there's that disparity, but the bottom line is, you don't have to take omega-3 fatty acids for your eyes. They Omega-3 fatty acids chew up your stomach anyway, so you don't need to take them for your eyes, but do try to eat the baked or broiled fish one to two servings a week. And again, this is just a recap of the formulations for the ARIDS-1 and the ARIDS-2. Again, in the ARIDS-2 formula, which is the more modern formula, they took out the beta carotene and they substituted lutein and zeaxanthine. And so again, not everybody has to take eye vitamins, but if you are told by your eye doctor after an exam that yes, you have intermediate dry macular degeneration and should be taking eye vitamins, take the ARIDS2 formula. And then this is a common question. People often ask, does cataract surgery accelerate my macular degeneration? And this was shown really very definitively in this 5,000 patient study that cataract surgery does not increase your risk of macular degeneration and it does not accelerate any pre-existing macular degeneration. And so the last disease we'll talk about is diabetic retinopathy. And this is sort of a schematic of how diabetic retinopathy can affect the vision. Here we see some fundus photos where you can see hemorrhages that are the hallmark of diabetic retinopathy. Uh, at a microscopic level, what diabetic retinopathy does is it affects capillaries or tiny microscopic blood vessels in the tissues whether it be your brain, your retina, your peripheral nerves, your kidneys, it can cause uh, disease of the capillaries. And on an angiogram, we see these little microaneurysms that are these abnormal uh, capillaries that have been affected by diabetes over time. Patients can often get cholesterol or what we call lipid leaking into the retina from these diseased blood vessels in the retina. And this is why as a, as a diabetic, and especially a diabetic who has diabetic retinopathy, it's not enough just to say, oh, I'm taking care of my sugar. You also want to take care of your cholesterol because simply taking good care of your cholesterol, whether it be by diet or taking special medicine, can help prevent or reduce leakage of cholesterol into the retina. Sometimes we'll do an angiogram to image these areas of leakage. This is an example here of an angiogram showing profound leakage at the center of the retina, and we call this diabetic macular edema, or swelling of the center of the retina from diabetes. And Here's a cross-sectional depiction with our OCT of retinal swelling. So usually the retina would be about this thick 
and here it's double the normal thickness. This is a depiction of scar tissue that has developed along with bleeding in someone with advanced proliferative diabetic retinopathy. This is one of the more advanced stages of diabetic retinopathy when the sugar has really been out of control for a prolonged period of time. And this scar tissue can contract and cause renal detachment. And so I would urge you when you go to see your eye doctor and you're diabetic, ask him, do I have retinopathy? If he says no, great. If he says yes, ask him, what is my retinopathy grade? We have a grading scale of what's called mild non-proliferative, moderate non-proliferative, severe non-proliferative, and then proliferative. And so ask him, what's your grade? If, if you're a mild, you're doing pretty good. If you're a moderate, you're doing okay, but keep on working on it. And if you're a severe or proliferative, you probably need to be seeing your eye doctor frequently, possibly having some interventions, and you need to continue to work hard on your sugar, your blood pressure, and your cholesterol. When people develop severe or proliferative retinopathy, we'll often do a laser called scatter photo laser photocoagulation, which is performed in the office. Um, when people have swelling of the center of the retina, so swelling at the center of the retina can develop at any stage of diabetic retinopathy. And so in addition to asking your eye doctor, what's my diabetic retinopathy grade? Also ask your eye doctor, do I have swelling of the center of the retina? Do I have macular edema? If it's absent, great. If it's present, then that eye doctor should be able to tell you, is that swelling involving the very center of the retina? If it is, treatment may be recommended. If it's not involving the very center of the retina, it may be possible to watch it every two to three months. And during that time, work on blood pressure, work on blood sugar, and it could very well improve. And what's great is that in the last 15 years, we have a lot of pharmaceuticals available for diabetic macular edema and diabetic retinopathy. And it's basically that same lineup of drugs that we use for wet macular degeneration. These as a family are called the anti-VEGF agents, and they can work really well injected into the eye for diabetic retinopathy. There's also a second family of medicines called the steroid family that we can use for diabetes in the eye. Um, and these are FDA approved and can also be used either as an alternative or in conjunction with the anti-VEGF family. So we have a lot of tools in our toolkit to manage diabetic retinopathy and diabetic retinal swelling. And of course, we also have laser for diabetic retinal swelling as well. We don't do this as much as we used to, but we still definitely use it. And it's a good intervention as well. Um, this is really important to talk about. What, what can you do to improve your diabetic retinopathy, to reduce your risk of diabetic swelling, uh, to prevent worsening of diabetic swelling? There's always a focus on blood sugar. And I find that even primary care doctors focus on blood sugar, but there are a lot of other factors that affect diabetic retinal swelling. And you really want to address all the factors. So high blood pressure, even when blood sugar control is good, if blood pressure control is not good, that can contribute to retinal swelling. Sleep apnea, which is often undiagnosed, can contribute to diabetic retinopathy. Why? If you think about it, diabetic retinopathy is affecting those blood vessels in the retina, so those blood vessels are not carrying oxygen as well to the retina. Well, when you have sleep apnea, your oxygen levels go down at night, so that adds an additional stress to the retina in terms of not getting enough oxygen. So if you've been told you need to use a CPAP machine, use that CPAP and it can help improve your diabetic control 
and your diabetic complications, such as diabetic retinopathy. Anemia, diabetics are often anemic, and if the anemia reaches a level of a hemoglobin less than 11, that can often exacerbate diabetic issues in the retina. Kidney failure can exacerbate retinopathy, in particular when there's kidney failure and the body is holding on to excess fluid. And I find that a lot of uh, eye doctors don't always hone in on this, and a lot of primary care doctors don't always hone in on this. If you're a patient who's getting injections for diabetic retinal swelling, and you're getting told, oh, your swelling is not improving, we're sort of stuck, look at your ankles and ask your doctor to look at your ankles. If the ankles are swollen and it looks like you're holding on at 10, 20 pounds of excess fluid in your legs, that's a sign that the body is holding on to too much fluid and that what we call increased extracellular fluid can contribute to difficulty in managing diabetic retinal swelling. There's also a class of diabetic medications. These are not used very frequently anymore and they're good medicines and we're not saying don't use them, but if you're a patient that has diabetic retinal swelling, this class of medicines, which is known as the thiazolid thiosolidina dions or the glitazone agents, commonly Avandia or Actos, those can sometimes exacerbate diabetic retinal swelling. So if you're on one of those medicines and you don't have diabetic retinal swelling, you're fine. You can, you can stay on that medicine. But if you're being told that you have diabetic retinal swelling Hopefully your eye doctor catches it, but they don't always catch it. Be sure to wave a little flag and say, hey, I'm on a Vandia or Actos. Could that be contributing to my diabetic retinal swelling? And then in patients with more advanced features of diabetic retinopathy, such as bleeding in the center of the eye or retinal detachment from diabetes, we will often do a surgery in the operating room that's typically a one to two hour outpatient surgery where we go inside the eye with tiny little instruments and we remove the jelly and we remove the blood and remove scar tissue. And most of the time patients can do quite well with this surgery. So I'd like to just sum it up in terms of take homes. What can you do to just take care, take care of yourself and help your eyes in general? And again, good, taking good care of yourself, blood sugar, blood pressure, cholesterol, maintaining a healthy weight, and then a healthy diet. The Mediterranean diet is great. Also eating dark leafy green vegetables, eating one to two servings a week of baked or broiled fish, uh, avoid tobacco. Uh, tobacco is, is very bad for the eyes. Um, those are really, it's really pretty simple in the grand scheme of things in terms of what you can do to benefit your eyes. And if you're told that you have intermediate dry macular degeneration, then yes, take the ARIDS2 vitamins. But otherwise, you don't need to take the vitamins and you can simply do these simple things here and um, you should hopefully do well over time. And of course, keep a yearly visit with your eye doctor because many of these diseases are relatively silent in their early stages. And that speaks to the importance of that yearly eye exam. And so I'd like to say once again, thank you for allowing me to speak today. And with that, I'll, I'll open it up to questions. Thank you, Dr. Dar. I feel like I learned a ton just now. <laughs> we have several questions, um, lots on macular degeneration. I am gonna start though. Um, we got a question via email uh, asking, what are the differences in LASIK and cataract surgery? So I know you talked about cataract surgery. Could you touch on that a bit? Yeah, so what I'll do is I'll go back to one of the little schematics here from the, let's see. Okay, so the cornea is the front window of the eye. And then 
The lens is located right here at the junction of the front one third and the back two thirds of the eye. Both of these structures actually provide focusing power to the eye. The eye is ultimately an organ that generates a focused image on the retina and then the image that the retina captures that image and sends it to the brain for processing. But the front of the eye is providing focusing power. Both the cornea provides focusing power and the lens provides focusing power. With cataract surgery, they go into the eye, the cataract surgeon, and he removes this structure and then he puts an artificial lens to take its place. And he removes this structure when it becomes yellow or cloudy with age and is no longer doing the job that it needs to do. LASIK is often performed at almost any age over age 20, and that's typically performed on a healthy eye where someone wants to have less glasses dependence. So it'll be someone who needs glasses to see far away. We call that myopia. And they'll typically use a laser to remove a very minimal amount of tissue from the cornea. The cornea is typically about 550 microns or half a millimeter thick. And they'll use a special laser called a femtosecond laser to basically trim the cornea down from say 550 microns to 450 or 400 microns. And by very minimally reducing the thickness of the cornea, they alter the focusing power of the cornea. And that helps overall adjust the focusing power of the eye and reduce the need for glasses at distance. And so LASIK or another version of it called PRK is a procedure that's been around for a long time. It's overall a very well tolerated procedure and overall an effective procedure. Um, some patients do develop dryness after LASIK or PRK. And that's been something that's been in the news for really the last 10 years. And recently, a couple months ago, uh, the ophthalmic device division of FDA came out with some research. So there is a small percentage of patients that have LASIK or have PRK. And the problem is that there are nerves in the cornea that trigger secretion of tears. And in a small percentage of patients, those nerves can be damaged. And so then those patients don't make tears as well, and they can experience dry eye. And then dry eye can lead to discomfort. The surface of the eye is dry, and then the eyes don't feel good. And again, this happens to just a small percentage of patients, but um, it can happen. And it is one of the most significant concerns with LASIK or, or PRK. Okay, that's great to know. Um, we're getting lots of questions coming in. So I was gonna ask you my own questions about all of that, but instead I'll, I'll read you questions from the audience. Um, why does the lens become cloudy with age? What does age have to do with it? Um, whatever the cause of cloudiness, can't that be treated as it happens and avoid surgery? You know, that's really a great question. And the lens um, is composed of water and, and collagen. And, you know, it's thought that probably it's, it's an oxidative problem. Again, the eye has a lot of oxygen and oxygen metabolism and some of those metabolic by byproducts over time make the lens slowly turn yellow and cloudy. And that's why the original ARID study actually looked at antioxidants in terms of delaying both macular degeneration and cataracts. And those, that antioxidant formula reduces the risk of, mac, of macular degeneration, but unfortunately, the ARIDS trial also showed that the antioxidant vitamins didn't do anything for cataracts, didn't, 
delay or reduce the incident of incidence of cataracts. And so unfortunately, we don't really have an intervention to slow down cataract development. You know, we say avoid tobacco, try to avoid excess UV light, but it's a great question. And the answer is we don't have it exactly pinned down why cataracts progress, why they, but, and we don't have a treatment or a, uh, a measure that we can take to delay that. And whoever comes up with something like that, I can tell you will do very well in the pharmaceutical industry. <laughs> Definitely. Um, okay, here's another one on cataracts and then we'll move to macular degeneration. Um, if you have cataract surgery, do you automatically get improved vision as if you had LASIK? Well, typically we wait on cataract surgery until the vision goes down a mild to moderate amount because we don't really wanna do cataract surgery prematurely because patients won't notice much improvement. So typically cataract surgeons will wait until the vision trends downward until the, and until the patient says, hey, I'm noticing I have a lot of glare from headlights at night. I'm noticing I'm struggling with street signs. I'm noticing that I'm struggling with the little strip of text on the TV when I'm watching TV. And typically after cataract surgery, patients will then notice an improvement in vision. Uh, but premature cataract surgery won't improve the vision. So th there's a little bit of a balancing act between waiting until the vision drops, but you know, not waiting so long that the patient has needlessly suffered a period of, of poor vision. Sure, okay. Um, macular degeneration. So these two are kind of similar. I'm gonna read them both and then let me know your thoughts. Um, so one question is, how long is the estimated time for dry to wet macular degeneration? And the other is, please compare dry versus wet macular degeneration in causes, uh, also patient symptoms, treatment, implications, any relationship between the two. So one is asking about progression, I think, and one is comparison. Okay, so let's first talk about, uh, let's do the second question first. Um, so dry versus wet. Dry is when early on you have those metabolic deposits that we call drusen in the macula and also alterations in the pigment of, in the back of the eye. And then more advanced dry macular degeneration is when you develop that frank atrophy or thinning of the retina and of the supportive tissues underneath the retina. And dry macular degeneration is very variable. Some people may develop a, some drusen in their 60s or 70s, and then over the next 20 years, develop a few more drusen, and that's it. Other people may develop drusen, and then five or six years later, start to develop a small area of atrophy, and then five or six years later, start to develop a larger area of atrophy. And so both the manifestations and the time course are variable, but even when there is progression of dry macular degeneration over time, it's typically over a 10 to 20 year time period. Um, in terms of wet macular degeneration and its progression, well, well, let's first talk about going from dry to wet. One concept is that going from dry to wet most patients with dry do not get wet. So probably over a lifetime, only five to 15% per percent of patients who have dry actually develop wet. So most patients with dry never develop wet, but when wet does start to develop, it can progress rapidly and patients symptomatically can notice fairly sudden onset of wavy vision or grayed out or blacked out central vision. And so wet, when it develops, can progress rapidly. 
And that's why it's important to monitor that Amsler grid. And if you start to see changes in the Amsler grid, don't sit on it, go get seen by the eye doctor, have that scan in their office, because if wet is starting to develop, it's really best to start those injections quickly. Patients do better if the injections are started at the very beginning of the development of wet versus if the wet has been going for three, four, five months, then there's going to be more scarring and less uh, visual recovery. And so be vigilant with the Amsler grid because wet can develop quickly and it's best caught early. Um, in, in, in terms of, uh, and we've talked about, in terms of time to wet, going from dry to wet, again, most patients with dry don't develop wet, but you know, it can, once you're intermediate dry, you could theoretically develop wet at any time or you may develop it never. And so it's hard to give any definitive guidelines as to timing. Uh, but the important thing is to stay vigilant with the Amsler grid and to keep up those yearly eye exams as well. And if you're diagnosed with intermediate dry, you'll probably be seeing a retina doctor every six to 12 months to have a scan, have an exam, and just keep, keep a watch on things. Okay, great. And then family history. Does the family history of macular degeneration increase your chances of getting it? It definitely does. And there's been some genes that have been identified and the genes that have been identified have to do with what's called the complement system, complement portion of our immune system. So our immune system has a lot of different components and one component of it is called complement. And it's thought that genetic defects in the complement component of the immune system cause the immune system to go a little bit haywire in the macula and not quite process these metabolic byproducts correctly. And that's why you can get the buildup of drusen and pigment alterations in the back of the eye, et cetera. You know, but the thing about family history is that it's not 100% either way. So you may have a family history, but you yourself may have no signs of macular degeneration or any type of precursors. Um, you may have no family history of macular degeneration and yet have signs of macular degeneration. So it can go either way, but it is important to mention to your eye doctor that yes, I do have a family history of, of macular degeneration. Uh, there's been some companies that have promoted this idea that oh, if you have a family history or if you have certain results on genetic testing that you should take eye vitamins or you should take our special formulation of eye vitamins if you have this gene or that gene. And there are some companies that have promoted that idea. And that's been relatively debunked using large data sets from the ARIDS trial and from the National Institutes of Health. And so, you know, that field may evolve over time, but at this time, it's not recommended that you take one of these exotic genetic tests. And then even though you have a normal eye exam that you then take this company's special formulation of vitamins, there's really not a lot of evidence behind that. Okay, got it. Um, let me go back to cataracts real quick. So the, the question about vision improving after cataract surgery. Um, so will I still have to wear my glasses after cataract surgery? So what typically happens is the cataract surgeon will ask you, do you wanna see well without glasses at distance or do you wanna see well without glasses at near? And then he'll pick the power of the lens that goes inside your eye for one of those two situations, depending on your preference. And then you'll need glasses for the other situation. So if you pick the lens that goes inside your eye for distance, you won't need glasses much for distance, 
but you will need glasses for near. And then vice versa, if you pick the lens inside the eye for near, you'll need glasses for distance. Now, there are a couple variations. Sometimes what they can do is for one eye, they can put the lens inside the eye for distance. And then for the other eye, they can put the lens inside the eye for near. And that's called monovision. And then your brain has to learn how to essentially switch back and forth, depending if you're looking at something far away or if you're looking at something close up. And some people, their brain can handle that and they love it. And then other people, they find that it's just too disconcerting to have the two eyes not be synchronized and they don't like it. And some people have monovision in their glasses or in their contact lenses. And so they're already used to it and they're used to the idea of it. And then when they have their cataract surger surgery, they can have that same thing done with the lenses that go inside their eye. Uh, other times the cataract surgeon might say, well, try monovision and contact lenses for a little bit and see if you like it. And then if you like it, then we can do it at the time of your cataract surgery. Uh, and then, of course, the other option with regards to cataract surgery is to get one of the so-called multifocal lenses. And those are lenses that have a segment of the lens for distance and a segment of the lens for up close. And so they offer some degree of glasses independence, but at a trade-off of overall, your contrast is a little bit reduced and you have a little bit more of a tendency towards halos and starbursts at night. So there's a little bit of a trade-off to the multifocal. And typically your cataract surgeon will make you watch a video that talks about these trade-offs and they'll sort of make you sign a permission slip that says, I wanna do a multifocal. I understand that there are trade-offs to a multifocal and I'm willing to accept those trade-offs. Okay. And I know we are close to time. We still have questions. Elena, are you okay if we go a couple more minutes? I absolutely am. I think we have to go another session. <laughs> <laughs> I think we might, yes. Um, right ahead, though. Okay. Uh, Dr. Dyer, you said you still have a little bit of time? Yes. Okay, perfect. Um, let's see, floaters. Um, there was a question about floaters in here and uh, what are they and how serious are they? Yes, yeah, so that's a great question and that's a big part of what I do. So the eyes has a, a collagen gel inside it called vitreous. And when we're young, I'll, I'll go to my diagram here. The vitreous is evenly distributed from the back of the lens all the way to the macula. And then as the decades go by, part of the vitreous starts to liquefy. And then the more formed portion of the vitreous will collapse forward. And so you'll have formed vitreous here, and then you'll have liquefied vitreous here. And we call that event, which typically happens in our late 50s, 60s, early 70s, a vitreous separation or a vitreous detachment or a posterior vitreous detachment. And when it happens, it can sometimes rip a tear in the retina. And that tear in the retina needs attention or else it can turn into a retinal detachment. Now we can have floaters all through life. Um, and so how do you distinguish what we would call a strandy vitreous versus this event that happens later on in life called a vitreous separation? And so when we're in our 20s, 30s, and 40s, when the light is a certain way, uh, we may notice the occasional strandy or wormy little floater. And those are generally okay. And that's just part of the jelly inside the eye becoming a little bit more strandy as the decades go by. And we call that vitreous sinaresis. But then once we get into our later 50s and our 60s, 
this event called the vitreous separation where the jelly really moves forward inside the eye can occur. And what are the tip-offs to that? The tip-offs to that are if we start to see a whole bunch of, of new floaters, um, you know, 50, 15 or 20 new little specks of dust, that can be a tip off that we're having the vitreous separation. Or if we start to see a lot of flashing inside the eye, we call those photopsias. Uh, so if you start to have a bunch of new floaters that come on all of a sudden, and or a lot of flashing inside the eye, that should really be brought to the attention of your eye doctor quickly. And I would say, don't go to the emergency room because they'll just send you to an eye doctor the next day. You're better off going to an eye doctor's office or calling an eye doctor's office and saying, I'm having a bunch of new floaters and or flashes. And that eye doctor should bring you in either that day or the next day to have a look typically. And most of the time, there's not a retinal tear, but in those instances where there is a retinal tear, it can often be lasered by a retinal specialist in the office, and that reduces the risk of subsequently developing a retinal detachment. And so that, that's our main um, precaution with regards to, to floaters. Got it. Perfect. Um, lots of questions about dry eye. Um, also, if you have um, cataract surgery, um, it seems like a lot of people have dry eye. How bad is it? And what are your recommendations for treating it? So dry eye, so we're talking about dry eye, which is different than dry macular degeneration. So when we're talking about dry eye, we're talking about a few things. We're talking about the surface or skin layer of the eye being uncomfortable. Often it feels gritty or feels sandy or feels like there's a speck of dust in there and the eyes are uncomfortable. And um, people can have dry eye at any age. Uh, dry eye is, gets worse with age. Excessive contact lens wear can make it worse. Smoking can make it worse. Um, LASIK or PRK can make it worse. Cataract surgery can probably exacerbate dry eye in the short term, but I'm not really aware of significant evidence that shows cataract surgery worsens dry eye for the long term. So I, I don't think that it does but LASIK or PRK can definitely worsen dry eye for the long term. In terms of treatments, just like um, everything, there sort of is a ladder of, of things that one can work through. The first step on the ladder is typically using over-the-counter artificial tears, and there are both preserved and non-preserved tears. If you just feel that you need those artificial tears once or twice a day, probably preserved tears, which tend to be less expensive are fine. If you're feeling that you have to use the artificial tears four to five times a day, you're probably better off using non-preserved tears, which come in little twist off um, containers. Uh, and then another good thing that's, Dry eye is often linked to inflammation in the eyelid glands. And so we often advise patients to use warm compresses um, a couple times a day for one to two weeks. And that will often help those eyelid glands flow better. And that can help with the symptoms of dry eye. And then there are other steps on the ladder uh, that usually come into play once you see an eye doctor. They may prescribe some medicated drops. They may prescribe a medicated ointment. Uh, there are some new procedures that can be done for dry eye in terms of uh, helping the eyelid glands have less inflammation. There are also some prescription eye drops that are can often be expensive that can help the eye make tears better, known as restasis and uh, zydra. Um, and so there are both uh, procedural interventions, minor procedural interventions, uh, and pharmaceutical interventions that can be 
used and, and be prescribed. But typically the first step on the ladder is try those warm compresses and try some artificial tears and, and see how things go. And after that, talk to your eye doctor. Great, okay. Um, let's try and do one or two more. Um, one is I am being treated for edema. Is there another type of edema other than macular? Um, well, edema of the retina is typically macular edema, and we didn't talk about enough about other causes of macular edema. Another common cause of macular edema is, is what's called a retinal vein occlusion. And that's typically linked to high blood pressure causing a transient thrombosis or clot in a retinal vein, and subsequently the retina gets swollen. And the interventions for macular edema in that instance are very similar to the interventions for uh, diabetic macular edema. But typically, we're treating either macular edema or edema that's about to encroach or involve the macula. Um, so that's, that's typically we are treating either macular or almost macular edema. Okay, and this uh, last one is about diet and the Mediterranean diet. Uh, one question is, does canned fish count, like canned tuna, tuna and salmon? And the other is asking for uh, examples of dark green leafy vegetables. So I would say that yes, the canned tuna, canned salmon does count. It still has uh, what, what's called L, L, LC PUFAs, long chain unsaturated fatty acids. And so yes, the canned, the canned fish does count. And then um, in terms of the dark leafy greens, broccoli, spinach, green beans, kale, collard greens, uh, and so those are the dark leafy greens that, that I often eat. Uh, I, I like my kale salad, but, you know, any of them can work. Perfect. I just had a kale salad. Um, well, this has been fabulous. We got lots of thank yous and lots of kudos uh, in the chats. Um, so thank you very much. I did put um, contact info in the chat window for anybody who wants to get in touch with you or our clinic. Uh, there's also an email address there. So if you have questions that maybe we didn't get to or that come to mind later, feel free to email at that address. Elena has all this info as well if you didn't get a chance to write it down. Um, but Dr. Dar, thank you so much. We really appreciate your help with this. You're yes. welcome. Thank you very much. Thanks to everybody for listening today and thank you, Elise, and thank you, Elena.